uh, for, for coming out and thank you for, for having me here today. I really appreciate it. I wanted to talk about uh, some of the stuff that I've been doing uh, recently at Khan Academy. I've, I've been there for about uh, uh, three years now, and you, you probably do know me best from my work on creating a, a jQuery. Uh, but I, I, uh, I actually st uh, stepped down from the jQuery project in uh, 2011 and uh, transitioned in, into working on Khan Academy uh, full time. At the, at the time, I was working at Mozilla. And because one of the things I'm really passionate about is using the tools that we have to really try and bring education to more people everywhere. And uh, I felt like Khan Academy was like really one of the best places to be able to do that. Uh, especially one of the things I'm really passionate about is trying to teach more people uh, programming. Uh, uh, this, the, the ability to program, the ability to understand code, because uh, I feel like it is a, a really empowering thing. Uh, I think probably most of you here might agree with that. Um, so what I've been, one of the things I've been doing is, is working on a computer science platform at Khan Academy. And I, I want to talk a little bit about that today because I think we're doing some really interesting things that other uh, uh, resources aren't doing. So I just wanted to give just a quick introduction to, to Khan Academy. Um, the, one of the big things that we're doing is, is, is just really trying to bring uh, uh, education to everyone everywhere uh, for free. And so we're a nonprofit. And we uh, create educational material, uh, videos, exercises, articles, and in our case, the computer science content. And it's all available up on uh, the website. It's, it's called Khan Academy after the, the guy who created it, uh, 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 Salman Khan. He, uh, started, he started out by creating uh, YouTube videos for his niece. Uh, she was struggling at math. It was, she, she couldn't understand certain concepts. And he had graduated from MIT. And he was an investment banker. And he, so he was like sending these little videos to help teach her. Um, and he put them up on YouTube for her. But in this process, other people started to watch them as well uh, and started to really, really like them. And it sort of exploded from that. We now have uh, uh, thousands and thousands of videos across uh, many different subject matter, you know, math and science and history and art history and uh, computer science. Um, so one of the big things that we've been trying to do, though, is try to provide a very personalized experience. So this means trying to sort of buck the general trend of education, where you go into a classroom and you're taught one thing, and it's meant to work for everyone in the classroom equally. Um, that, I'd say, we generally feel does not work very well. And we want to provide an experience where students have the ability to choose what they learn and work on it at the pace at which they're best capable of. Uh, of course, uh, this is hard to do in a traditional classroom, but it's really, it becomes a lot easier to do once you bring in technology. So just so some uh, uh, screenshots. So like we have this, uh, 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 when you, when you, if you join the website and log in, we provide all sorts of uh, tools to let you know uh, where you are, what you're currently working on, what you could be working on next, uh, pr providing a very clear path um, from where you're beginning and, and to where you could be going. Uh, up, up at the top there, the thing that looks kind of like um, like one of those little GitHub uh, uh, of work charts is actually, so this is, that's all the different math uh, exercises that we have on the website. And so you can see, in the case of this particular person, they have you know, this fraction of math understood. And so, there, but you see, there's there's still a lot more to understand, uh, 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 theoretically, as they continue to work. Um, so we do have lots of exercises. One of the first things I worked on when I uh, joined Khan Academy in 2011 was working on the exercise framework, making it much easier uh, to build exercises and to provide these to students. So you know, you, you know in this case, you know, this is a more traditional uh, uh, math exercise. Another thing that we do is we structure our content throughout the website 
into sort of what we call tutorials. So we have uh, sort of this linear structure. So in this case, we want to learn about graphing and analyzing linear functions. Then, then, then we have you know, all these uh, videos and exercises all integrated so you can learn through, go through and, and learn that particular topic. But the big thing though is that obviously students don't learn uh, in a vacuum. We want to make sure that they have sort of the additional tools that they need, and especially that teachers need in order to make the education happen. We don't want to replace teachers. We want to empower them to make sure that, uh, that they can provide a better experience to their students. So for example, we have lots and lots of uh, interesting tools and dashboards uh, for teachers so that they can uh, uh, track and see exactly what their students are working on, uh, what they're doing right now, what they're struggling with, and give them sort of ability here. So you can, you can see specifically, in this case, uh, this is one exercise, four digit subtraction and borrowing. And you can see what students need practice, what students have mastered it. And, in this way, you can start to kind of cluster students and be able to give a fraction of a classroom individualized, or, or I should say semi-individualized instruction. Uh, so in, in this case, instead of a teacher having to do one generic lecture for an entire classroom that's meant to teach everyone, uh, no matter what their skill level, in this way, we can start to bin students more appropriately and be like, okay, these students are all struggling with this one particular concept. Maybe you should be teaching them uh, 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 just that subset, you know, that's the subpart, you know, of four or five students, and work with them directly. Uh, so just, just some stats. Uh, currently, we uh, currently have about three million problems being done per day, uh, about ten million active students per month. Uh, so, and this is primarily uh, uh, students who are, you know, K through twelve age range. Although we do have uh, uh, adult learners, absolutely. So I wanted to talk about the programming uh, uh, stuff that we've been doing. So this is something that uh, I started work on uh, pretty soon after I joined. So this here is the uh, uh, computer programming portion of Khan Academy. And right now, we actually have a, a, a three-person team that's working on it. It's really exciting. It used to be just me uh, and some interns. And now we have a, a, full, a full team. So I work primarily on the, the back end. Uh, we do a lot of, uh, our back end's uh, uh, Python, sorry, um, uh, uh, Python and Google App Engine. And, uh, and I also do uh, you know, front end stuff, a lot of JavaScript. And uh, one of my other teammates, Pamela Fox, she works on uh, content creation and some back end work and a new, uh, 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 teammate we just joined, uh, Brian, who's also working with me on the back end stuff. So I wanted to kind of walk through those because I feel like we're doing some things that are really, really interesting, that are very different from uh, a traditional model. So one of the things I wanted to show here, um, so we have a little bit of the curriculum. Um, I just realized, okay. Uh, okay, so yeah, so uh, we have a little bit of curriculum here. I wanted to show one of them. I realize I may not have audio, but. I guess we'll see. Um, and we tried some different techniques for teaching people programming. Because the thing is, uh, is that when, I, I didn't feel that a, a pure video format would work very well for teaching programming. Because the thing is that when you're presented with a video, it's a very passive experience. You know, you know if someone's talking at you, you see the code going, and whereas when you're learning the program, what you really want to be doing is you want to be trying it yourself. You want to get in there, you want to write some code, uh, and you want to have sort of this feedback, this back and forth, and see how it works. So one of the things that we did uh, was have this ability to, we have a video-like thing, and uh, uh, what it does, yeah, you know, let's keep it muted. Uh, so what it does is, is as, so right now the, 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 the presenter is talking, I'll just keep it muted. Um, and as she talks, uh, we see here the editor, there's uh, typing happening. So what's actually happening is that the talking is actually synchronized with the typing in the editor. So th right here, this is, this is the environment that we, we, we give the students. It's a, a code editor side by side with a graphical output. We use JavaScript and we use processing JS uh, to do the, uh, the graphics. So we're rendering onto a canvas here. Um, so, but in this way, what's interesting about this is that 
the presenter is actually using and manipulating uh, uh, the editor in real time. So for example, they're right now they're talking about drawing rectangles. I'm like, okay, well that's really interesting to me. Uh, uh, wait, I wanna pause. So I now pause this. I can go in and be like, wait, the, she was just working with numbers. Wait, what if I put in like 50? What would happen there? You know, what if I put in 100? So, like, so this isn't a video, this is an editor. Um, and at any point, you can pause and manipulate it and see and get this better understanding of how it works. Um, so, so again, so, so they can be like, okay, cool, I think I got it. That number is controlling how tall it is. All right, cool. Uh, you can resume, it resets the code and continues where it left off. Um, so, so in this way, we, I feel like this gives a much more, uh, uh, let's say, practical experience where again, where you can have that feeling to be like, okay, listen, try it out, listen, try it out, uh, and keep going. Um, oh, they also have the ability to uh, draw and uh, uh, write things uh, on the on the canvas. Um, so one of the things as well. So I just wanted to go into the um, the code area really quick. I'm going to do a little bit of coding today. Um, so this is sort of the <clears throat> as I mentioned before, sort of the 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 general scratch pad, if you will, where we have the code that you can write followed by the graphical output. And so you have all the sort of things that you would normally have in processing. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, processing is a very, uh, let's say, procedural uh, uh, language for doing graphical uh, uh, drawing. Uh, uh, so you can just say stuff like this, you know, you know, draw an ellipse, fill it with a certain color. Uh, you can, you know, draw another rectangle someplace else. Uh, you know, pretty exciting stuff. Um, and uh, so, in, so in this way, we wanted, the reason why we picked JavaScript and processing is for a couple reasons. Uh, well, one, I, I'll just say straight out, I'm pretty biased, but I, I'll, uh, uh, I, I think that's kind of a given. But the uh, at least for, for this, I feel like JavaScript can be a really good language, uh, a really good first programming language um, for a couple reasons. One, it's relatively ubiquitous. Uh, uh, it can, you know, it's, it's available in every single browser and virtually everyone has a browser. Um, and uh, two, the, it, it's used, uh, used properly, let's say. Uh, it, can, it can be a really good introduction uh, uh, to programming in general. Um, if you stay away from some of the scarier bits. Um, so one of the things that, that we want to do is, is pairing it with, again, this processing, which is relatively simple to use, we can provide this sort of environment. Now, a couple of things that, you, that we provide are, so that you, you notice here, if you click a number, uh, should I make that bigger? Can you see okay? Okay, okay good. Um, so if you click a number, for example, you get a little scrubber uh, and you can start to uh, scrub numbers around and manipulate uh, the output. Um, so you can see, so because one of the things we really wanted was sort of this tactile experience of, because a lot of times, like when you're dealing with numbers like this, these are incredibly opaque. It's just like, you put some numbers into this thing and things happen, like what's actually going on here. So in this way, we wanted it so that students could interact with these things and be able to understand sort of inherently that okay, I may not know what this thing is called, but I know that when I change it, it goes up and down. I mean, it, and as you progress, you might know that, okay, now this is the Y uh, axis, and be able to work with that. But in the meantime, you can sort of intuit these sort of things. Um, so one of the things, uh, additionally, is that you have the ability to manipulate colors. So for example, you have a nice little color picker. Um, and you can, you can do that in real time as well. Again, like we don't, we, we wanted to try and stave off sort of the annoying bits for as long as possible. Uh, so for example, again, like we, we talk about RGB and like what that is, uh, but we just, we just do it as an introduction to be like, okay, well, he, this is roughly what it is and I'll just use this. Uh, because like uh, we, we can get to that much, much later. We don't need to be teaching 10 year olds what RGB is. Um, so, a couple of things that I really wanted, and again, having this responsiveness. So, so you can see, as I mentioned before, you know, like, you know, having this uh, um, sort of instantaneous feedback is good. However, um, 
what, what's happening right here, right now, is really simple to do. Essentially, what's happening is this, prog uh, this program is relatively static. There's no interaction whatsoever. There's no animation. Nothing's happening. So every single time one of these numbers changes, we just re-evaluate the code and run it again. Uh, I s I've seen a lot of little code editors out there that do this sort of thing. Now, that's cool, but the thing is that once you start getting any, any sort of program that's even moderately complex, uh, that kind of goes out the window. So just to kind of show you something that's a little bit more uh, involved, let's do a basic animation. Um, one, and let's go back on again. OK, so we have it animating now. A little ball. So in, the, in this case, processing has what's called a draw loop. If you're not f uh, familiar with that, th this is a pretty common concept used in uh, uh, video games, um, graphical 3D stuff, uh, graphics in general, I would say. And what it says is essentially this function is called as quickly as possible, as quickly as the, the, the computer can call it, again and again and again. And, uh, and this is how you essentially replicate basic animation. In this case, we have an x variable. Every single time the draw function is called, x increments, and then therefore the ball is, or the circle is going to be moving across the screen. Um, so you can obviously see one problem here, uh, one that's going to keep going off the screen forever. Um, so let's do this. All right. With equals minus, oops, minus one, and let's see if we can catch all of them right here. Uh, all right, so that should do it. There we go. OK, so, so you notice here, so I was typing and writing this code, but it never stopped. Like the ball kept was going, it was still going, and it was hit the side. And like a, as I was writing this code, I finished it, and then the ball hit the side, and then it started to bounce back. So this is a real-time coding environment. Like as you write the code, the environment responds. And you can see this even more immediately, where you can be like, OK, this thing is bouncing around. But like, OK, what if I didn't want an ellipse? What if I wanted a rectangle? All right, now I have a rectangle. And it's still doing what it was doing. The state is still preserved. It is still you know, at the, its current x position. And in this way, it's a much more responsive experience. And you'd be like, OK, well, you know, I didn't want that color. You know, how would this look? Uh, uh, oops, uh, how would this look if it was you know, red? Um, and what if I put um, this stroke wave? Where's it? Oh, shoot. Uh, shoot, stroke four, stroke wave. Eh, whatever. Okay. <laughs> um, oh, very excited. That's why you have docs, right? <laughs> stroke weight, damn it. All right. Uh, um, God, I did it again. Okay, sorry. See, live coding. All right. So, but the thing is here is that again, in uh, you know, being able to, I, I feel like being able to manipulate this in real time provides a much, uh, uh, a much purer experience, and especially because you see here, like, this box is bouncing around; it's continuing to travel. I'm just manipulating these numbers as it goes, and the state is continuing to go. The animation is continuing to go. Nothing is stopping it. You know, it's not re because the thing is, like, if this was not happening. What, what, uh, like if we just evaluated this again and again and again, the box would just be reset back to zero, reset back to zero, reset back to zero, and then like that's like the worst experience. You don't want that. Um, so this is something I felt really strongly about that that we should have. Uh, I was inspired very much by the uh, the talks that uh, Brett Victor had done, um, and I wanted to try and bring this to to a, a larger audience. So. Uh, uh, and, and, and yeah, I feel like I feel like this can be uh, uh, extremely compelling. Now, one of the things that's big about this, so, so just to show here, so okay, uh, you can save your program. Um, and once you save it, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, once you save it, it becomes publicly visible. So this is saved to your personal account, and other people can see it, and. You can share this. So like the URL up there is, is completely public. You can paste this to someone, you know, send this to a friend. And this is a really big thing that we wanted. In my, ex in my personal opinion, uh, uh, 
teaching programming works best in two ways. One, uh, uh, you don't teach programming for the sake of teaching programming itself. You teach programming to use it to, let's say, accentuate something else that the person really likes. So if the, for example, if the person is really interested in science and physics, show them how programming can make science and physics more awesome. If a person likes art, show them how programming can make art more compelling uh, or make really interesting uh, pieces of art. And so in this way, uh, uh, we want to sort of harness that and then uh, as a side effect, make it so that if students make a program that they're really interested in, that they feel proud of, be able to share it with others. So in a, in a large way, we, we kind of uh, co-opted some of what uh, I feel like GitHub has done, which, which I think is really interesting, you know, having this model of people coming together, uh, uh, looking at each other's code, collaborating, and sort of learning by reading each other's code. So one of the features we have on the website here, so we have, there's this browse programs area. And these are all programs created by people in the community. Uh, uh, large, uh, mostly these are students. Uh, um, and so these are the ones that are currently hot right now. So like we have a hot, uh, like a, it's like a Reddit. We actually use the same algorithm as Reddit actually. Um, and so this is like what's currently hot as voted by uh, uh, the students. And it's, it's interesting, I, I can talk a lot about sort of the dynamics of having a community of like, you know, uh, uh, 200,000 13 year old programmers. Um, <laughs> because it's, it's really interesting. Uh, it's very different from most other programming communities. Um, so I, so here's, here's the top program here. I'll just open it here in the back. Uh, here, I'm gonna re restart it real quick. Okay. Uh, I, I've never seen this before. It's called Escape. Um, so this person apparently made a game of some sort. All right, let's give it a try. Uh, so that's, okay, I'm a ball, I'm moving. All right, cool. I'm collecting stars, I assume, all right. Um, all right, so this is, this is good. This is like, you know, your normal like flash game type thing. Uh, I assume I wanna avoid, oh, shoot. Uh, uh, all right, there you go. I need the key to lock the door. Cool, got it. Um, Okay, so next level. All right, you know, continues on and on. Um, so, so this this is made by a student who goes by the name Infiltration, which is pretty cool. Um, uh, okay, so but I mean, there are a couple of things I want to know here. Uh, one is, again, we have everywhere you go, we have the same environment. We have the code over here. We have the graphical output here for everything. And this is important because I feel like, you know, if I'm someone who's coming along, I'm like, okay, this is really cool. He made this game, I wanna understand it. Like, how did this game, how was this game made? Um, so I might go down and be like, oh, okay, well, here's the code. There's lots of variables. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so there's, <laughs> it keeps going. <laughs> All right, but okay, so like here we go. Okay, so there's, there's the key image, okay? So we have, a, we have an image picker here. So you can see the key up there. So I wonder what happens if we go and change that key to something else. Um, uh, let's, oops, uh, let's change it to a chest. Um, there we go. So, the, now, so now the keys are chests for whatever reason. But that's the thing, it's like, like again, like we like, like being able to have this experience of being able to dig in and introspect and change things and again, use that process to learn. Uh, oh, so like, okay, okay, well here's the variable, lives. That seems useful. What if we change that? <laughs> Let's just ramp that up to eight? Let's now we have eight lives maybe? Oh, it disappeared. I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's too many lives. Maybe you can't render that many lives. Well, I can try, well, let's, let's see. Let, if, I, if I die more than twice, do I, uh, I'm still alive. Oh, so I do have the lives. All right, I can just crank that up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, but that's the thing is that like, again, like I feel like this is how programming should be. Like the, w when I started to learn to program, I did it with, uh, uh, with QBasic. A friend of mine came over to my house, brought a floppy disk on it with QBasic with a couple programs on it. And he, he gave it to me, he said, you gotta try this out. Uh, this is so cool. I put it in and I played around with the programs 
And I didn't have any books or anything on this. And this was uh, um, before I had the internet. So it's just sort of like looking at the code and trying to figure out what these things did, uh, sort of divorced from any context. Um, and sort of like in that process, I ended up making like some sort of like little dungeon mud thing where like, you know, you go north and you hit a monster. And I think you just died at every single direction. But, um, but that was, I, I found it to be super compelling because that was the first time where I had gone in and I had built something on a computer. Like, like this was something that was mine, that I owned, that was my creation. And I wanted to try and harness some aspect of that. So again, but I feel like a large part of that came from the fact that I could see that code, I could see how the programs ran, and I wanted to try and harness that so that if you see someone else's stuff, you can go in and sort of receive the same sort of experience. Now the big thing here is again, like GitHub, we have sort of a, a forking model. So for example here, okay, so I have this new version of this program where you start off where you have a chest instead of a, a, a chest instead of a star, or sorry, a chest instead of a key, and you start off with 277 lives. Um, that's great. Um, let me just go in and save that as a spin-off. I'm gonna say um, uh, escape with more lives and a chest. All right. So I save that. And I've now forked that project. Okay. So now this is my version of it. And you can see here, so it says based on escape. So I can, I can go back to that, and I, I will here. Um, so, 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 but down beneath the program here, these are all the other versions that other people have made of this particular program. Um, so you can see here, there's, you know, there's all the different spinoffs. Um, oh, it looks like someone, okay, so someone made it, instead of a little uh, circle you're moving around, made it with a, a, a little girl. Uh, someone else made it so you can pick an avatar to play with. Um, it looks like people are like changing some of the stylings on some of them as well. Uh, so yeah, so like in this way, you end up with a lot of like really interesting iteration. One of the things we see pretty frequently are students who are building like a game, and they'll build like the first level of a game, and they'll be like, "All right, this sort of works. What do people think?" And then someone will come along and spin it off and make like the second level. Then someone will spin off of that and make like the third level, and it kind of you have this kind of sort of collaboration going on, and it works. Similarly, but very, very differently from GitHub. Uh, because the thing is that when you have an experience that's like this, we wanted it to be very front and center. And that you went and viewed a program and immediately beneath it, you have all those other programs right there. And so you end up with students who, who are doing this, essentially this much more collaborative uh, uh, iteration, back and forth, back and forth. Um, so this is something I think I think is again is really interesting, and and again I feel like it tends to encourage uh, sort of that exploration. Uh, because we also have the ability for students to be able to leave feedback on a program, uh, uh, so people are like, you know, providing suggestions, say nice job, uh, and they're like they're posting their scores. Uh, this is a very good game, nice coding. Yeah, so it, it, yeah, obviously it's nice. Um, so. Another thing that we wanted here is obviously, we, so we have a sort of this large environment for students to be able to play around in, but we also wanted the ability to uh, uh, essentially challenge students. Let me find a good one here. Um, because we wanted something in between, you know, having these pseudo videos that you can watch and manipulate the code on, and sort of like this free form environment where you can code anything and do anything. Uh, we needed some sort of structured uh, uh, teaching in there. So like for example here, we built these things called challenges. Okay, so this is a challenge. And we want you to go through step by step and do a certain set of things. So in this case, you can see here, uh, the challenges in this particular step, call the cherry, start off by calling the cherry, probably red, it's an ice cream cone here. Okay, so we can see the cherry, and we can see it's all nicely commented. Uh, so let's, let's try, uh, uh, let's try calling it. And you see the hint here is saying fill blank, blank, blank. So it's giving you a hint. You probably need to be using uh, uh, the fill command. Great, let's do that. Boom, cherry is colored, next step. All right, so next one, this is now color cup, make your, uh, your favorite color. 
Uh, again, this is, the, this is like one of the first things. Like you're trying to get them to be familiar with just coloring things in general. OK, so we see the cup here. OK, let's fill that in. Awesome. OK. Now the ice cream. Let's fill that. Oh. So it says you're using the same color all of the fill three times. Use a different color. Uh, so again, it's, it's trying to get you to trying to give the hint that maybe you should like you know try to be uh, unique to some degree. Um, and now color all the ice creams. Okay. So let's try red. Let's try another red. Oh, using the same color. Let's try green and blue. Great. I'm done. Okay. So you saw, so, so there are a couple things here that I think are really interesting. You notice, you saw the hints there where it was catching specifically that you had used the same fill three times and that you shouldn't be doing that. You should probably have some new unique colors. And you also see the hints here uh, uh, where uh, it's saying fill in these gaps. And this is using something. Uh, um, called structure JS. I just forgot to bring that up here. So this is something that we built last summer. One of my uh, uh, interns built this. And what it allows you to do is something I'm, I, I like a lot. So here is, here is a structure of a program we want a student to create. Okay? And on the right is the code that we're going to test. Now you can see here on the, on the left where what we're doing here is a static analysis. All right? we're, we're, we're parsing the, the code, turning it into a syntax tree, and comparing uh, uh, the code on the left to the code on the right. But it allows us to do stuff like this, where it's saying, OK, we want if something, and then something is plus equals something. Like We don't care what it is. We just care that there's something there. All right? But then you get the interesting stuff like this, where we have a loop, and we say, for uh, of our dollar sign a equals dollar sign start, and then essentially a normal a normal loop. Now, the interesting part about this is that everywhere the dollar sign a exists, it has to be the same value. So, just to kind of show you an example here. All right, so we can check this program. We can see that yes, in fact, it does currently pass. But let's say I go in and say, all right, for i equals zero, i less than ninety nine, j plus equals one. Uh, it does not pass anymore uh, because you are, I'm not using the same variable name everywhere that that should be used. So what we do is we build up a whole bunch of rules around this. Uh, for every single one of the challenges, we have all these static rules, and we, we present them to the user, and that's what they have to write. Now, the, one of the cool parts about this is that, obviously, this is the code that we use to do the static analysis in the back end. However, it also makes for really good hints to the user. So just I'll, I'll go down to a more complicated one here. Um, uh, calculator, let's do that one. OK. So you see here that this is a bit more complicated. You're writing functions. But the thing here is that if you look at this code, you know, we want them to write sp three specific functions that return something. But literally, all this is is taking that code, that structured JS code uh, that you saw here, and literally all it's doing is, is replacing the underscore blanks with a literal blank and presenting it to the user saying, you need to write this. Uh, now, we use this relatively sparingly because we want to make sure that the students, again, ha have uh, uh, some, some degree of uh, free, thought, free thought and creativity. Um, now, because the thing is, is that there are a lot of programming exercises and tutorials out there that are very, very literal, that are like, write this precise code, and then your thing will pass. We did not want that. We wanted the students to be able to um, you know, have their own variable names, whatever they may be, be able to have, pr print their own text, whatever they may, they may be, be able to have other things in there. Like if they, you know, in the uh, uh, ice cream one I showed a minute ago, you know, we want them to write fill statements, for example. But if they have other stuff in there, if they add lines, more ellipses, other things, we don't care. Like, like we, we want to leave that to them. We want them to have free reign over how it's presented and how that's manipulated. Because um, again, we want them to be able to take these things and make them into their own. Uh, so yeah, so this has been something that we've been working a lot on. And again, it's something to feel uh, uh, very passionate about. Another thing 
uh, that we've been working on recently is the ability for students to be able to uh, get help. So I just want to go back to, um, uh, okay, I have my, okay, so here we go. So here's the program I wrote earlier. Um, I have to log in. Blech. Okay, so one of the things that we, we now allow students to do, in this case, so you see beneath the program here, it says request help. If you do that, you can post a question, and this goes out to the general community. So for example here, this is the current help request queue. So these are all students who, are, who need some help with their programs. Because we wanted, we wanted a way, essentially, you can think of this as Stack Overflow, OK? So, so the students have a very specific problem with their program. You know, they're trying to make some animation happen. They're trying to make their game work. They're trying to do this thing. Uh, so they post a question. Um, it says, I thought I put the right program for the ball to move, but it just stays there. All right, so that sounds like a legit problem. Um, maybe having issues with animations. So you can scroll through and see, OK, so here, here's someone having a problem. It says, hello, as you see, it's the car from animations. I've been trying to get it to turn back and start over. What do I do? That sounds a lot like the ball thing that I was doing earlier, that they, it goes to the right and doesn't come back. And then, so this person says, create a new variable v. Initialize it as one. Assume your car goes back and forth, blah, blah, blah. He explains it, and it says essentially what kind of code the student would need to write in order to achieve that result. So, so again, this is, again, much more, it's like Stack Overflow, but the advantage here is you have the context of the program itself at all times. So that person, that person who was helping went to that user's program, looked at it, and said, okay, this is what you need to write, or this is the sort of stuff that you would need to do in order to achieve this. But obviously, you can see that they didn't write all the code for them. They just provided sort of a clear instruction as to what they should be doing. So in this way, like we're trying to, sort of take the best aspects of all these different online communities. Because again, like I feel like, uh, like we're at such an advantage right now with like sort of uh, uh, the overabundance of open source code that exists online and the fantastic communities that exist. I wanted to try and harness that and bring it to uh, uh, education. So just to, uh, um, just to close out here, I wanted to show some of the other curriculum that we've been doing. So we have sort of, as I mentioned before, we have sort of this basic uh, drawing and animation. Um, this is, you're, no one here is going to need this, uh, unless you have kids, in, in which case you, maybe you do need this. Um, but you, you essentially, we work our way up and kind of get up to the level of like doing object-oriented code. Um, and we also have been doing more recent stuff, which is like doing game design and visualization. And most recently, we've been doing, uh, uh, we just ported this over this last week, um, which is doing natural simulations. So these are, uh, let me see if we can find some really cool ones here. Uh, so this is doing stuff like um, you know, vectors, forces, swarming. Um, we have a swarm here, I want to find it. Oh no, maybe not. Um, particle systems, uh, let's find. Let's find a cool one. Um, is that just the intro? Yeah, that's it. Um, there we go. So yeah, so I mean, this is stuff that's way more complicated, and that you know we, we're starting to do, teach them about like you know uh, uh, doing vector math, and the, well, one of the nice parts about doing this at Khan Academy is that if you don't understand one of these concepts for example, doing vector multiplication. We have all the tutorials there on doing vector multiplication because we have a bazillion videos on every math concept. Um, so we can see here, so again, so this is, uh, this is part of the tutorial on teaching, uh, teaching particle systems. Um, whoop, but there's, so there's one. So there, there, this is a particle system. Probably kind of slower now because I'm gonna have like a bazillion tabs open, but the, uh, uh, this is some of the more complicated stuff that we have out uh, right now. But this is sort of stuff that might be of interest to you as well. So I just wanted to close up there and uh, maybe uh, take some questions if you have any. Thank you. Yes. Their 
So the question was, uh, so we have the ability to do a spin-off of a program. Do students have the ability to see their progress, or you know, essentially have like a version control, yeah. essentially? So internally, we do. We don't expose it yet. So we do have versioning over like, you know, like every time they say, we keep a separate uh, 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 state of their code. Um, we don't expose that yet. Um, we do use that a little bit for just in our challenges to make sure that they're actually doing the work. And they're not actually just pasting in giant blocks of code and trying to pass it. Um, but uh, that's something we, we've been thinking about exposing. Like, because obviously, you know, teaching students about version control and keeping, keeping state, but not only you know, yeah, for their parents, being able to see you know, what they're working on, what they're doing, uh, would be really useful. It's not something we've done yet. I'm just not sure what the best way is to communicate that. Like one of the like for example, one of the things that we've been really wanting to build is sort of a module system, because there are a lot of things that these students are doing over and over and over again. Like like for example, building a button that you can click, all right. Um, so someone, but the thing is, is that like uh, we're not entirely sure yet how to make a module system that is resilient to people changing it all the time. Because the thing is, is that like, they're still relatively early on in their development, in their learning of programming, um, that they may not realize that if they have a, a button module that's now used by a thousand other programs, that if you just decide to change it one day, that it's gonna break all those other programs. You know, that's something that we understand because we've done this for a while, but uh, we're not entirely sure how to get them to, or like how to teach that in a way that makes sense without being like really weird and, and having to teach about like versioning and stuff like that. I don't know. Anyway, it's an unsolved problem. It's something we would love to do. I'm just not sure how to do it yet. Uh, so the question was, do, do we, uh, we, we expose information to teachers that may not be accessible to the student. At least for the computer programming stuff, not yet. Uh, we, we, we do expose like when they, when the student does a challenge, when they watch one of the videos, when they, when they do those particular tasks. So one of the big problems we've been facing with this content is that contrasting, contrasted with the uh, math material on our website, for example, um, Everyone has to take math in grade school. There's standardized curriculum. There's now the Common Core curriculum, which is all across the, uh, the US. There is no such thing as that for computer programming. The closest you have are like the AP exams, but that's not until much later, and not everyone is a big fan of those exams. Um, so what we're doing here is relatively uncharted territory in that you, there, are t there are teachers in classrooms and schools and parents and t students. You know, like, there are people using this, absolutely. But they're all doing it in very much a way that is, um, like they're just making their own road. Um, so, but, but, and, and so at least for now, we're, we're doing it. It's a very iterative process. You know, we listen to the teachers and students. What do you need? We work on it. You know, we, we, we have this dialogue going back and forth. So yeah, so in that way, we're definitely looking to find things to expose to teachers and parents to make it to provide a much better experience. Yeah, maybe, maybe information about uh, the versioning and what the students are writing or what, what have you. Yeah, I'm not sure yet. Yes? How is it getting the teachers or the schools to adopt it? And uh, how, how do you get students to adopt programming at all? <laughs> so the question was, how do we get teachers to adopt this? And how do we get s schools to adopt programming at all? Uh, very hardly, hard, hard. Uh, <laughs> Um, I mean, the way we've been doing it so far is honestly just waiting until, I mean, because we have this up there. We have, we have guides for teachers. So like, like we, have, we have lesson plans. We have guides of what teachers could be doing. Um, and we just kind of wait until the teachers use us and come back to us. Be like, hey, we've been using this. Uh, like, like I think, um, uh, like my, my coworker Pamela today, she's visiting the school where the entire school is using this with like 200 students. Um, and so obviously that's pretty interesting. We want to know how they're using it and like what they're using it for and like how that's going for them. Um, and, but in this way, we're, we're, it's not one of the things that we can be as proactive about so because it is hard to get that sort of adoption. It's hard, it's really hard to be, go to a, a middle school or high school teacher and be like, hey, you should take time away from teaching things that are going to be tested and that your salaries are based upon 
you know, and instead teach programming which doesn't matter to you at all, that you don't know any more than your students do. You know, like this is the other thing is that, you know, while, whereas a teacher has been taught most, a, a grade school or high school teacher has been taught uh, uh, math at some point in their career, they have probably not necessarily been taught programming. So they themselves might be learning as well. Um, yeah, there are a lot of sort of, um, sort of let's say structural, <laughs> institutional barriers here. Uh, so the question was, is Khan going to try to influence the directions of tests and, 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 what, and what's... That, that's a whole, yeah, it's a whole separate conversation. Yeah, I mean, obviously, there are a lot of things we would love to have changed about education in general. Yes. Yes. Not immediately so. Um, not that we're biased, but more that it's just hard. <laughs> in that, you know, once you start getting in the back end, you're like, okay, let's teach you databases and teach you networking and teach you uh, uh, scalability and CDNs and they, you know, I don't know, whatever else you might teach. But like, it, it's, um, it's not clear how we do that in a way that scales especially well uh, and especially that is easily accessible. Because the nice thing about this is that they need nothing. You know, they just go in and start doing it. Um, um, but yeah, obviously being able to have, like we, thought, we definitely talked about this, like how can we provide them with basic networking, with a basic data store? And at least get them thinking about like, how do you like, store stuff in a data store? And how do you like, communicate between two things together? Yeah, but, but we're still, again, like we're not entirely sure how to formulate that yet. All right, last question here, sir. Um, so the, so the, this was uh, the, the, the asking about the real-time editor, how we did it, and are, are we were sharing it. So that's something uh, that I wrote uh, personally, and, uh, and I'm in the process of open sourcing that. But the, I'm, I'm hoping to get it open sourced by this summer. Um, it's, it's, tie, it's tied really closely to our system right now, so I'm, like tr I, I'm actively in the process of extracting all of this and turning it into its like, own little reusable widget. The one thing I'll, I'll mention about how we did it, it, it's, it's too long to go into here, but I will say that every single technique that you say you're not supposed to use in JavaScript, we used it, all right? <laughs> um, evals out the wazoo, uh, with statements everywhere. With statements are super powerful for this sort of stuff. We use that to extract state out of a program as it's running um, and be able to inject it back into the, uh, the, the other runtime. Um, yeah, that stuff. Yeah, it's, yeah, all, yeah, all those things. That those, that's what we're using. I can, I can. Yeah, if, if find me after. I'll, I'll be around after. And I'll, I'll be at the, uh, the 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 party after, as well. Do I have time for more questions, or am I out of time? Am I out of time? All right. Well, we are just letting it go. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, so the thing, that, oh, so the question was, you know, like, what about doing, you know, C plus plus Java, Python, or you know, uh, something that is more readily applicable to a, a college curriculum? Um, so yeah, so. And I know that's completely harder. Yeah, it, it, yeah. So it's way, way harder for sure. Um, but also, to some degree, we don't want to be the end all and be all of programming education. I would much rather be the thing that takes a student, like the, the, honestly what I want to do more than anything else is take these uh, 10, 11, 12, 13 year old kids who don't know what they want to do and show them how interesting programming is, how it can impact their lives. Um, I want to plant that seed, all right? If, 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 if the Khan Academy CS stuff does nothing more than plants the seed of that programming is a thing that can be done by me, boys and girls, um, 
then I think that would be success. Uh, so, but, I, but in that way, I don't, I mean, there are lots of other curriculums out there, you know, Codecademy and, and, and not to mention, you know, Coursera and all these other things that are teaching online programming in other ways. But yeah, again, then, like we're not trying to, to do that. Um, you know, you know we, don't, we don't have curriculum on like artificial intelligence and stuff like that. As, you know, like, but like we could do something like that someday, but like I feel like right now, I feel like we can have a much bigger impact targeting this specific audience. Um, but there's one more question. Yes. So the question was, how effective has Khan Academy been at reducing the disparity between male and female programmers, especially at this age? Um, so thus far, so Khan Academy on the whole uh, is about 50-50 male-female. Uh, understandably, since most of it's just generic you know, math, science, what have you. For the CS stuff right now, I want to, I'll have to double check the, the most recent stats, but it's something like, uh, 36% female um, and 64%, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> math on the fly here, 64% uh, uh, um, male. So yeah, so it's good, but not great. We want that to be much, much higher. Um, but the thing is, is, what we're finding is that there's, once the students come in and start using our curriculum, uh, they achieve the same results Absolutely, Male, uh, 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 male students and female students get the same number of problems right and wrong and pass at the same rate and create the same number of programs. And like, so, so the hard part, there, there is some other stage before us that we need to tackle, we haven't found yet, which is there is something there that is stopping girls from even getting to our thing. And then, but, but obviously once they get in, we seem to be doing pretty good. Um, and again, so that's something we want to do even better at. Um, uh, hopefully, we're getting there. Yeah. All right, so that's it. Thank you, everyone. Um.